Welcome to another edition of In the Labs with Todd. As you know, I really like trays and dishes, and I thought that it would be nice if we could make another one of those. I'm a guy of habit. I like to come into my house and drop my wallet off in the right spot and put my keys where they belong. And I've always been a big fan of these leather catch-all trays that you see on Etsy and so on. And I thought that we could probably make one of those out of wood without using any 3D content, just using the molding toolpath. And this is what we've come up with. So we've used mainly two molding tool paths to make this. Now there's some other tooling in there, which I'll explain later, but there's a molding tool path that we use for the inside, which is kind of a reverse molding tool path. And then we also use it for the outside. And we make sure that we have the right wall thickness so we make a nice solid tray. Now I'd like to take you through the software and show you how I made this. Let's have a look at the files that you're going to receive with your project. Now we're going to look at these using vCarve Desktop, but you can also look at these in vCarve Pro or Aspire, depending on whatever software you own. So let's open an existing file. And if you navigate over to where your project was installed, you're going to find a file called catchalltray.crv file. So let's select that and open that up. Now when you open this up, you're going to be presented with this these notes. Make sure you read and understand these. Um, the material that we're cutting this particular project into is substantial substantially thick. So you're going to make sure that you choose the appropriate tools for the material and the feeds and the speeds on your machine. Make sure they're all safe and appropriate. We don't want you getting hurt. And then click OK if you understand all that. Now let's have a, a look at the actual job setup. So it's a double sided job. The width and the height are 11 inches. The thickness of my material is 1.535 inches thick. We're going to zero off the top of our material surface. Our datum is always set to the center. We're going to flip bottom to the top and we're using a standard modeling resolution. There are no 3D models in this, so you can go ahead and use the standard or the fastest resolution that we have. Um, but keep in mind that if you do throw in some 3D content to make this your own, then you're going to want to up that substantially to make sure that um, everything works out OK. And I would choose very high if I was you for that. And we're going to use Canadian Maple to view this in. So we're going to click OK. It's going to give you a warning right away. We know that we're going to cut through this material because we need to do a profile cut. So that's what it's just telling you. It's just warning us ahead of time and we can just click OK to get past that. Now This is a two sided job. So right now we're previewing it in the two sided view and you can see some of the vectors are visible that are on the back side of your job. But we're going to turn that off for the time being and we're just going to focus in on what you see here, which is the profile of the molding tool path, the extrude rail or the drive curve that we're going to use to drive this cross section along. And then an offset of this, that's the width of the inside of my dish, which is equal to the width of the vector that I'm using for my cross section. This cross section was drawn to scale. So if I select that and press T on the keyboard, you'll see that it is a half inch wide. So that's going to be the wall of my dish is a half inch wide. So from the top of it down to the bottom of it is a half inch. And then the height is 1.285. Now you're going to ask me where I got that number from. Well, it's actually a quarter inch less than the thickness of my material. That way I'm going to have a bottom thickness of my tray of a quarter inch. Okay, so if you add a quarter inch to this, you're going to get 1.535. So let's close that down. Now, some things to look at when you look at this drive rail is that it is a continuous curve. It's connected at all, both ends, okay? And also, it actually runs over top of itself. So these corner bits are actually a line that goes all over top of each other. So if we look at our node view of this, and I pull out this node, you're going to see that there's actually a straight line, and these lines actually go over top of each other. So our molding toolpath is going to drag this cross section along this line up to the end, around the corner and back again. And with these over top of each other, it'll actually drag it back. The, the edge of this, the bottom edge of this will line up to create a nice round bottom to that. And you'll see that in a minute. Now, I don't want to confuse you, but if we take a look at our toolpath, you'll see that we have quite a few here, but the two that make up the molding toolpath are right here. There's the sweep profile number one. That is a clear toolpath. That's going to use an end mill to clear out the extra material. 
And then we have the actual sweep that will be cut with the tapered ball nose end mill. If you need more information on how to use this molding tool path, there are some great supporting material on the Vectric support site that you can watch and learn from. So I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of this, but I'm just going to show you what I've done to do what I did to make this tray. So if we go ahead and tile our views, we turn on these two tool paths and we have a look at the actual setup for this. So we're taking that cross section. If I hide my 2D drawing visibility of my tool paths, we're taking this cross section, we're driving it around this drive rail. We're making sure that there is no gap at the top. The gap is at the bottom. So we have that quarter inch that I was talking about at the bottom. We're gonna use a tapered ball nose. We're gonna vary our step over so we get a nice smooth edge to that. We're using an end mill, approximately a quarter inch end mill to clean out um, all of the extra material before we go in with that tapered ball nose. Okay, we don't wanna break that off. And that's important because again, the thickness of this material, if you don't have that in there, you're gonna end up breaking your tool. So be very, very careful and also, Pay close attention to your machining allowance. If that is too much, then you may not remove the material where you think you need to, and you're gonna end up breaking your cutter. So pay close attention to that, please. We're not gonna machine the flat regions. There's no ramp plunge move. There's no machining allowance. We're not gonna create sharp corners, no boundary offset, and we're not gonna make an automatic one, okay? So that's important. Make sure that's set up properly. When we calculate those, you'll see that if we preview those, we have our clearance tool, and then we have our finishing tool and that is perfect okay that's exactly what we want now we have a couple of challenges ahead of us here we need to get rid of this huge lump of material in the middle which is pretty easy to do just a pocket tool path um, but you need to get the right shape and then we're gonna have a little bit of extra left behind that we need to go in afterwards now in order for you to understand how I've done that don't pay attention to the order the tool pads are in right now, okay? These are in the order that you need to cut them in so you do the least amount of tool changes. Um, but as I was building this file, I looked at exactly what you saw. I created this molding tool path first when I was happy with that, that was great. Then I realized, oh yes, I need to go ahead and do the next tool path, which is gonna be a pocket tool path. So I did, did that next. So if I turn on the other vector layers that we haven't talked about yet, you'll see that there's this inside line right here this guy right here this is used to pocket out the middle of this now how did i get this radius on there well that radius is slightly larger than my end mills diameter that i'm going to use okay i used a tried true method of doing that of figuring out what that vector is and i'm quickly going to go over that here i chose this original vector that i used for my actual um molding tool path, the drive curve. I selected that and I'm going to go ahead and do a series of offsets. So it's a series of offsets using the radius of my tool, which is half the diameter. So it's outwards once, make sure that you use the radius of your tool. I'm not gonna create sharp corners. I'm not gonna delete the original and I'm gonna select the new one. So we're gonna offset outwards. Now I'm gonna delete my original, but I'm gonna offset inwards twice. So offset in twice, one, two, and if I go outwards once more, and again, delete my original one, you'll see that the end result is that shape. So I now know that I'm gonna get that cutter into that corner, but you can see there's a little bit of extra material that I'm not gonna to get to. So how am I gonna do that? Well, I'll get to that in a second. So let's close this down. I'm gonna delete that vector that we just created out of there. If we look at my pocket tool path here, you'll see that it uses that vector that I had created originally. We're using that quarter inch end mill. We're starting at the top of my material. We're cutting all the way down to a quarter inch less than the depth of my material. So that way I've got that uh, thickness at the bottom of my tray. It's gonna take 11 passes. This is the longest tool path you're gonna run. We're using offset tooling. And we're gonna go ahead and calculate that. And then we'll preview that visible tool path. And you'll see what's gonna happen. It's gonna cut all the way down one step at a time. And then we have a nice flat bottom. But we also have these little teeny triangles here that don't get touched. So I have a couple options. One, I thought, well, I'll just go in and sand those out. Might be easier, might not be. But I had to change my tool anyway to go ahead and do my profile of my um, 
of my edge here first using that tapered ball nose. So if I sorted my tool pass out in the right order, then I could go ahead and add in this little clearance one. So if I double click on that, you'll see that I'm using that tapered ball nose that I use to do my molding tool path with, but I'm only using these little triangles here in the corner. I'm only cutting those triangles. So how did I get those? I simply took a copy of that offsetted vector that I used for my pocket and I subtract it from a copy of the original drive curve that I used for my molding tool path. And when I do that, I end up having these little corner triangles left over, along with some other bits that I just deleted away I didn't need, but I needed these corners. So when you take a look at this particular tool path using that tapered ball nose, making sure that I start at the very base of my tool path, the base of my tray, which is again a quarter inch less than the thickness of my material. I don't go down any deeper than that. We calculate that and we preview that visible tool path. You'll see that I have a nice clean bottom of my dish. And that's what I was looking for. Now I added to that, of course, my dowel holes so I could flip this over and I added in a bit of V carving to make this my own. Of course, I would really hope that you would take this and change that V carving up to make this your own file, or maybe putting a date, maybe a wedding anniversary, maybe a great, great groomsman gift, or just say dad's stuff or mom's change. Now on the back side, let's take a look at that. If I flip it over and we turn on the preview of my second side, the only thing I'm gonna point out is two important things. One is that in my 2D view, you'll see that I can see the vector that I used as my uh, cross section to create the inside of my tray. Then I have this vector. This is the actual vector I'm gonna to use to extrude around this drive rail to create my underside of my dish. Now the difference between these two is what I call my wall thickness. This is gonna be at the base of my material. There's the quarter inch we were talking about. Then you're gonna be asking what happens at the end of this cross section. Well, there's this extra little leg here which happens to be the diameter of the tool that I'm using. I'm going to overshoot a little bit out here. That way I'm sure I'm going to get to the bottom of this. But also I'm going to stop short because I need to put tabs in here. You can't add tabs to a molding tool path. So if I just cut this on its own, my part would actually fall out. So I needed that extra space in there. So let's preview those. So here is the, um, the sweep profile, the clearance profile, and then also the the sweep profile. So if we preview those two visible tool paths, it's the outside of my tray, which this looks really nice in the end. I'm really quite happy with that. It looks very clean. And then if we, because I stopped short here, I can now add a cutout tool path. So I can preview that cutout tool path and I get my tabs in there and they look perfect. Now you're going to say, Todd, there's a couple extra tool paths in there. Yes, there are. I have a optional pocket tool path that you can run if you'd like, but this is gonna remove off the surface of the piece of material that I'm using because it's repurposed and I wanted to not do a bunch of sanding on it. So this will actually clear off the, um, the patina that's been left for the, from the years of its service as a countertop. So I preview that, that's gonna get rid of that. And then the last one here is the dowel holes. Now, if you've never done a two-sided cut before, I really suggest that you take a look at some of the supporting material on, on the support site at vectric.com. It will show you how to do a double-sided job. There'll be a link below and also there'll be a link in the PDF that you get on to one of those videos that will help you understand that. You need to run this first, take your material off your table after you cut the first side, run this tool path, put the dowels in, flip your board over, put it back on, and everything will line up perfectly. But again, there's a much better description of that on the site that you might wanna watch. And if we preview that, then everything should line up perfectly. And when we're done, we take our board off, we should have a part that looks like this. And to prove it, let's now go to our machine and cut these tool paths. I had to countersink the screws in order to get my material screwed to the surface of my waste board. That's when I discovered that this material was really, really hard. Here we are cutting our pockets for our dowels. Let's start to cut out all of that material from the inside of our tray. Now this again is the longest tool path. And I had to use a long reach end mill in order to get to the bottom of the actual tray. 
And this is where I think in the end, I probably would have not made this tray as deep. That way I wouldn't have needed to use such a long cutter. The next tool path is our clearance tool path for the inside of our tray. Now this is part of the molding tool path and you can see that I got right out into the ears of this tray. Now if I had added any machining allowance to this, my end mill didn't get out into those ears. And because of that, I think it caused one of the little teeny problems we had later on. There's the stepping. Now see right here, I put my Cupid ball nose in and it's gone right out to the middle of the ear. Now, if I had have put that machining allowance into my clearance tool path, then there would have been material there and I would have chanced plunging right into that material and it probably would have broken my bit. I'm using the extreme length of my tool to get this all cleaned out. And because I didn't use a machining allowance, you'll see that that is a line inside of my actual tray. That could have been alleviated if I could have added a little bit of an allowance. Now here we are going in with that same tapered ball nose and just cleaning up those little arrowheads at the bottom of our tray. Now for a little bit of customization. I ran this V-bit toolpath twice actually just to clean up the inside of the B because I really wanted this to be nice and sharp. It's a pretty fast toolpath so it didn't take too long at all. Now here I am cutting the dowel holes into my waste board. They were pretty tight, so I used a mallet to get those in with. And it was a perfect fit. Now let's run the clearance tool path for the back molding tool path. What we didn't show you there was we had to replace the collet on our CNC. So the, the bit did get a little loose, but we managed to save the part. We're about halfway through now the finishing tool of the molding tool path using that tapered ball nose again. We swapped out that tapered ball nose for our end mill and we cut our cutout pass. I really love the way the countertop looks in the end when it's all cut out. It looks really sharp. Using my handy little saw, I cut those tabs and remove the tray out of the piece of material. Now for a little sanding. I had to do a little extra sanding because of, again, the, the result of the collet not being the best in the machine. And then I discovered that the end mill, that long reach end mill may have been a little bit dull. I chose just to use a very basic mineral oil finish, which I think was a great choice because that really pulled out all of the uniqueness of this material. It looks really, really nice in the end.
Barring all the little issues I had on the CNC machine, this actually turned out to be a quite a nice object to look at. I'm really happy with it. If I was gonna cut it again, I'd do a couple things a bit different. First of all, I'd increase the angle of the inside of my tray. That way it would make my surface finish a bit smoother and it would also maybe alleviate some of those issues that it's having on the CNC machine. Also, I would make it a bit thinner, not quite as deep. That way I wouldn't need to use such a long tool in the end. Now, if you wanna cut this on your own or modify the tooling and make it your own, then please head over to your Co account and download the project for free. And if you do cut it, we'd love to see it in the vector form. So post it there and share it with all of us. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, please do. And I hope that you really enjoyed this project and come back for more. Thank you so much and be safe.